This is North Georgia This Week, and I'm Martha Zoller. It is great to be here with you. It is always fun to be uh, kind of beginning the week with you all. I uh, want folks to go to ClassicCityToday.com uh, for any news that they need, as well as ZPolitics.com for any news of the day. Uh, also, you can email me with ideas for the program at Martha at MarthaZoller.com. And what we're going to try to do over the next number of months, um, we will have uh, different issues that we'll be talking about. And I thought this was an interesting one because it has a local angle as well as a statewide angle. And Amanda Swafford is here with me today, and she is a former city council member for Flowery Branch. She's also a libertarian, and she has been nominated as the libertarian candidate for United States Senate in Georgia. And she works in the building where our studio is. She's an average person that's got a job just like everybody else does. And she lives right here in our own community. And And Amanda Swafford is here with us today. Amanda, thank you so much for being with me today. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me on the show. First of all, tell folks a little bit about you. Well, I've, I've grown up here in Hall County. I went to school here in the local area. I went down to college at Agnes Scott and near Atlanta. Um, and then worked in Atlanta for one of the top law firms in the city and then went out to California to try my hand at law school and, and did law school for a while, but then decided I liked the paralegal work a lot better. Um, so I worked in California for some time out there and actually ran for office when I was in California um, and got involved in some uh, a land use community a committee out there and land use and dealing with some land use issues um, and then decided to come back to Georgia. And Georgia was where my home was and uh, a lot of family out here and just decided to come back out. Um, out here and so I've been here ever since and uh, got involved on the local level in politics. I ran for city council there in Flyery Branch and served a term there um, and have been here ever since. Now tell us about the election to city council. Is that a partisan election? Do you run it under a party? It's it's not. It's nonpartisan and it's a district. It's not districted so you do run citywide. And you serve four years, or is that two years? It is a four-year term, but I came in under special election. At that particular time, we had uh, Craig Lutz, who is now serving as our county commissioner, uh, leave his post to run for that position because the way the office terms are staggered, you have to, if you do want to seek a higher office, such as a county commission term, you have to give up your office to run for that. Okay. And, and now you are the Libertarian candidate for United States Senate. What makes you... Uh, what's unique about you uh, as it relates to these libertarian candidates? Well, I guess the primary difference is I have held elective office before. So often, most of the folks that we have that are drawn to the Libertarian Party get involved in politics, and it's their first kind of entry into the world of political activism. Um, you know, we get criticized sometimes a lot because we, the, we t people tend to say we siphon votes off from the blue, blue parties or the red parties, but really, we, we tend to get a lot of people that come into politics for the first time, and they've never really been involved in either party. Um, and I guess that's kind of what makes me a little bit distinct is that I've held a political office before, um, and I come from a long line of history of being involved in politics. Um, I've been involved, really, from a very, very young age of following national elections, state elections, and, and local elections. And particularly in college, I was very active, did a lot of political internships for a wide variety of uh, different organizations and different political action committees um, all across the board. So I've got a wide breadth of experience with the, both political parties and the Libertarian Party. So tell us about the status of the Libertarian Party in Georgia right now. Well, you know, we've had uh, it's we've had a lot of successes, actually. Um, you don't hear about those a lot in a lot of ways. Um, but in uh, 2008 and 2012, we had statewide candidates that were able to amass a million votes um, in two separate races. Um, which in one particular instance I think was more than the presidential candidate um, was able to receive on a nationwide basis. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Um, you know, in, in both of those races, we did have situations where we only had two people running in the race, so there wasn't a th three people, uh, three candidates running. Um, but still, that's that's a good victory in a lot of sense. It's a lot of people that are willing to actually vote uh, when they're given the choice. You know, they're voting for folks there that they believe are aligned with who their political philosophies are in those races. What do you see as, I mean, because Georgia has had a kind of up and down relationship with the Libertarian Party, but it has been fairly strong as it relates to other states. And uh, But there are some ballot access issues. Why don't you explain to people what it takes for a Libertarian to get on the ballot for all the different races? 
Sure. You know, the nonpartisan races are, are fairly easy with that because you don't declare a party status. And so for most of those, it's it's no no more difficult than it is for any of the other parties to to uh, run for those races. But for the other races where you're looking at maybe your state house or your state senate races, on those particular ones, uh, there are certain requirements set up where you have to get a percentage of the vote totals um, to get on the ballot in terms of your signatures. So you're having to go to individual houses um, in most situations and talk to people about signing a petition petition um, to get on the ballot, um, and you have to get a certain, certain percentage of registered voters. Um, and I've participated in this. Actually, last weekend I was out help helping one of our candidates in the 21st House District down in Cherokee County, uh, Jeff Amison, who is aggressively trying to get on the ballot there because we have, there's one uh, House District um, member who is running uh, for re-election in that district who will have no competition whatsoever if Mr. Amison does not get on the ballot. Um, and it's a very difficult process because our electorate is just not as uh, potentially educated as maybe they need to be on the whole process. And so trying to get them to explain that signing the petition to get Mr. Amison on the ballot is not endorsing Mr. Amison. It's not an advocation of his goals or anything like that. It's just to allow an individual to participate in the electoral process is very difficult. Um, so you have that hurdle. Statewide, um, the, the Libertarian Party, once you attain 1% of the vote total in a statewide race, the, the Libertarian Party retains its ballot as access um, as a political body in the state of Georgia. So we have that statewide access. That's why you see a lot of Libertarians not necessarily running for the state house or the state senate, but we'll have candidates for governor or senate. Um, and we do get asked that a lot. Well, why don't you just run for school board first, or why don't you run for, you know, state house or state senate? And that's why. I mean, there's still there are some school board races that are partisan, um, but some of them are not, and we are able to run for some of those. And we had. Um, a successful candidate two times um, in Ma the Marietta City School System most recently, Brett Bittner, um, was actually able to win twice in an election for C Marietta City School Board um, in the Board of Education there. Now, the, and so I want to make this very clear to you folks that this is one thing that Democrats and Republicans agree on is they don't want it to be easy for people to get on the ballot, okay, and that are not Democrats and Republicans. And so what Amanda has just said is that basically in the offices that you could win, that you could actually build some some groundswell and build a party, those, those starting offices, you know, um, uh, state House, State Senate, it is very hard, even Congress, very hard to get on the ballot. You have to get all these signatures, and it's very difficult and time-consuming and expensive. It's also very difficult and time-consuming and expensive to get on the ballot as an independent candidate or a third-party candidate uh, out there. These other races, statewide races, uh, presidential races, it's much more e easy to get on the ballot. And I personally believe it's because the parties think those are the hardest to win. So they make it easier to get on the ballot for the harder ones and all of that sort of thing. So, um, you know, we are uh, looking at a lot of different things there. So, you know, we got to be aware of ballot access. Um, now, this is North Georgia This Week. We talk about the issues that are important to you. We have a local person from Flowery Branch that is the nominee for the Senate candidate uh, for the Senate uh, in the United States Senate. She will be on the ballot in November because they don't have to have a primary process. And, um, you know, that is exactly what we're going to have to do here. Now, um, let's talk about issues now, Amanda. Tell us what are the most important issues to you and why you're supporting them. Uh, well, first and foremost is the, the spending problem that we have in D.C. <clears throat> I think spending goes to every issue all the way down uh, to any other issue that we're going to talk about today. Um, it really addresses the fundamental uh, access to everything that touches on uh, all the issues that will be addressed in the Senate race. Um, and I think we have a responsibility to the next generation to fix D.C.'s spending problem. Um, 
the power to protect America here at home. Um, we really have a lot of issues that we need to really look at um, in terms of protecting things within our own borders before we go out and try to expand and, and be the policeman to the world, uh, which you hear a lot about, of course. Um, but there are a lot of places where we have um, things set up to protect other areas all throughout the world, which we have to question and look at why are we over there when there's areas and gaps in our own security here in, in America. Um, and thirdly, government must preserve our individual rights. That is to me and to the Libertarian Party, I would say, and to, to a lot of individuals here in America, the primary purpose of government. If you look at the Founding Fathers and the whole reason kind of for for founding our country, that is where they saw the tenets of the government is to protect the individual rights. It's not to get out there and advocate and, and to push for new laws and new restrictions on the individual rights. Um, it's to preserve those individual rights. And so what are, what are the other issues? Obviously, spending is one of the big ones. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, in terms of spending, you know, there's, there's so many things every day that, you know, we kind of even get behind as a nation. Uh, for example, the, the, the TARP program is the first thing that comes into play. Um, you know, when they had the, t the 2008 uh, bailouts, um, I remember just watching that and almost seeing unanimous support in Congress for that um, and looking at some of the folks that I had watched in previous elections talk about being fiscal hawks and how we really had to get serious about watching corporate welfare and we really had to, you know, toe the line on, on spending and those kind of things. And I thought, you know, this is your chance to really stand up and make a plan for getting us in out of the economic calamity that was about to come that they said would happen if we didn't pass this this uh, program you know and there was no true leadership that came out of that I mean it was like we've got to do something now and and nobody had prepared for something that like this that may have come that's but one example now um, as you campaign what does your campaign look like right now well you know part of I think one of the real reasons I wanted to get into the Senate race is is to kind of help move the Libertarian Party forward. I think we have a lot of issues internally that are great to really use candidates for to to heighten the issues within your own party and say, look, these are the things we kind of need to work on. And I think Art Gardner, for example, has done a good a job of this in the Republican Party in using his platform to kind of bring out and say, these are things we need to address within our own party. Um, and I think that's part of it is looking at, you know, I had mentioned earlier that a lot of the libertarians come into the movement without any political experience. It's their first time getting involved in politics. They've just decided enough is enough and they need to get involved. So we really need to train them and shepherd them a little bit better on what that means and how to step up and get involved in the in the political system. We don't really need to reinvent the wheel here. I mean, we've been, you know, the, the blue parties and the red parties have been doing politics for so long, they know what they're doing. I'm not saying we need to copy them in every in every situation, in every way, but there are certain organizational things that are done right and done correctly, and there's no reason that we couldn't, in some sense of the way, at least structure our campaigns that way, or at least become more actively involved in running campaigns and, and put our primary focus as a party on winning elections, not so much maybe winning on the policy debates. Yeah, and I think that that is you know, a, a challenge, I think, for, for the Libertarian Party. And look, I am a committed Republican. I, you know, I jokingly say I came out of the closet a couple of years ago because I ran for Congress. And not that everybody didn't know I was a conservative, uh, but I didn't join Republican organizations and I didn't do that kind of thing. But since, you know, you kind of qualify as a Republican and run for Congress, everybody kind of knows now that you're a Republican. But I have great friends on the, Repub on the Democrat side, on the Libertarian side. And I think it's because... I like the exchange of ideas, and I don't think we're doing enough of that. I don't think we're doing enough of sitting around the table talking about an issue. So I had a situation this week where I got to do, on the last minute, I got to do a, a television program called The Big Picture, which is a more liberal-leaning show that's uh, that Tom Hartman does. And I'm sitting there, and literally, I had not met the other panelists. I didn't know the other panelists because I, I was just kind of brought in at the last minute. And I made a comment, and the person next to me just attacks me and starts making all these assumptions about the things that I think as a result of something that I said. And and it was what was interesting about it is that this person wanted to make, after knowing me for three minutes, you know, wanted to say what I thought about everything, and that in 50 years my grandchildren were going to be embarrassed about the positions that I've taken today. 
And I sit, looked at him and I said, you've known me for five minutes. You're going to make that assessment about me? I haven't known you for five. I mean, I'm not doing that. And what I finally said to him was, look, all I'm looking for from you is the same respect for my views that I'm giving to your views. And that's what, that's what I think it ought to be all about. I loved what um, earlier today on Georgia's Morning News, we talked to Karen Handel, who's running for the United States Senate. And everyone always asks you about compromise. And she said, she used the term negotiate for progress. Mm-hmm. You know, compromise shouldn't be a dirty word, but it's kind of become a dirty word. But you got to negotiate all the time, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I think that's very true. You know, and there's some circles that, you know, you go in and, and – the fact that, you know, when I was in college, I did an internship with the ACLU. And, you know, some circles I go in and talk to people, they would instantly use that to discredit me. But I think that's a very valid statement that you really expose yourself to a lot of different people. You listen to a lot of different viewpoints. And I think it's incredibly valid. If you shut yourself off and you only surround yourself with a certain group of individuals and people, your issues are not going to be touching on the things that everyone wants you to be listening to. I mean, you have to be centered in everyone's issues. Now, you're going to be on the ballot no matter what. Somebody's going to be on the ballot from the Republican Party and from the Democrat Party. Most people think it's going to be Michelle Nunn. There's a school of thought out there that says, okay, all this libertarian's going to do is throw the Democrat and Republican into a runoff, which means that's going to be in January, and it's going to throw Georgia behind. So why should you libertarians be running? And I know you hear that. You've probably heard that said to you. Sure, absolutely. You know, and I, I don't buy that at all in the sense that, you know, it's no different than we were out uh, uh, working with Jeff Amison in the House District 21 in Cherokee County, helping him to get petition signatures to get on the ballot. If you have any kind of disagreement with any of the other two candidates and they know that you only have two options on that ballot, they really have less reason to listen to you in a sense. But if they have to fight for the independent or the swing vote or there is a third option or there is a possibility that they're going to have to go even further and look for an option to run into a race in January, they are going to have to fight a lot harder to really reach out and understand the entire electorate in Georgia, not just the electorate that they are serving in their individual parties. So it makes them better candidates and it makes them much more responsive to the electorate if there are an, an additional option in that race and people take that additional option such as a libertarian candidate, serious. What are you um, looking to do, and what is the structure of the Libertarian Party doing to try to make it more viable in Georgia? Well, I think, you know, to, to a large extent, we have some viability. As I spoke about earlier, we had the candidates that had reached the million, do- the million uh, vote threshold, um, and those candidates arguably, you know, weren't as aggressive in going out and seeking the votes. They just had, a, they, you know, they did some campaigning, but they, in some sense, took advantage of the fact that there were just two options in, in the race um, where they were on. Um, I've run campaigns before. You know, we are, we are doing things that campaigns traditionally do. We are, we are doing fundraising. We are making calls. We're doing letters. You know, it's not on the scale that you see with the traditional parties, of course. Um, but a lot of that, you know, goes back to some responsibility for the electorate to understand whether they want candidates that are going to be beholden to million-dollar campaigns. Um, but we are doing those things. We're aggressively now, even early, this early in the process, getting out and getting involved, being in festivals being in parades. We are being incredibly uh, visible and active early on and trying to do as many things as we can way across the state all the time and being incredibly visible. And I think that pays off. You look in a race in Virginia where we had Robert Sarvis run for governor um, there in that state and be able to pull a good percentage of the vote and uh, attain a lot of respect in that race. And that was one of the key factors in his uh, in his ability to pull the numbers and pull votes that he did is his work ethic of just getting out there and being as actively involved and just talking to people and not trying to hide um, some of the campaigns. I mean, that's one of the criticisms of Michelle Nunn on the Democratic side is that she hasn't been out there in this primary process. And I think, you know, there's some legitimate criticism that's come from the base of the Democratic Party. Here we are. Why, you know, should we vote for you out of the sense of entitlement? I certainly don't think even as a candidate of the Libertarian Party, that I deserve any kind of entitlement vote like that. I'm out there, and I'm going to be working for that vote. Yeah, you wonder if her name was Michelle Thomas and not Michelle Nunn. 
uh, if or Marcel Jones, if it would be that kind of issue. Um, and 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 there is a little bubbling that you're starting to see in Democratic circles. And look, I don't think it's enough that she won't win the nomination. OK, I'm not saying that. But uh, I think the fact she's out there spending money right now and she's uh, when she really shouldn't have to spend any money, but she's got a lot of money on hand and, and it'll be a difficult thing to do. Now, um, who are the other candidates on the Libertarian ballot? Uh, we have a governor, uh, governor candidate by the name of Andrew Hunt, who's a successful business owner that owns a, a biotechnology firm. Um, and then we have a public service commission candidate by the name of uh, Aaron Gilmer, who's running in the fourth district uh, PSC race that will be the same one that uh, we've got the current Republican um, contest going on between Laura McDonald and Craig Lutz and uh, Doug Kidd. So those are the three candidates and so uh, you've got at this point, but the way the Libertarian Party is structured, we don't qualify our candidates until the end of June. So at our uh, convention process, we actually nominated uh, paper candidates that you're allowed to do. And so as the process goes through from here to June, we can do substitutions. If we have folks that come in, our executive committee can actually do a vote to do a substitution if we want to. So could you have somebody come up and want to run against you within the Libertarian mm -hmm. Party? Only if I gave my consent to that. The, okay. the paper candidate or the candidate that was formally nominated would have to do the consent and sign some paperwork and get that done. So I'd have to give that consent. So you run totally as a convention process, a libertarian, the Libertarian Party. It's a convention process sure. as opposed, or a caucus, I guess, would be a better way to say it. Sure. Yeah, and, and that's really, the, you know, ideally in a party situation, that's really the best way to get your ideal candidates going. I mean, this primary system that we set up for the electorate is really not a good way for a party to run its elections. And when you think about it, you're having as a party, if you take the Republican Party per se, you're having anybody off the street who does not know anything about the Republican Party go into the ballot box and choose your candidates. When ideally the convention process is a lot cleaner process because the invest party members are have are being able to choose who your candidates are so I've never really been a fan of the whole primary system being out in the open in terms of being a taxpayer funded system where anybody can process it be involved in the process and you've got a whole structure where you know not only taxpayer dollars are paying for it but you've got a government supporting it and being involved in it where it's out of the party's control and out of the party's hands well you know in the Georgia GOP convention last year in May in Athens we actually and I was on the resolutions committee and we actually tried to get a resolution out there that said that we would support and look at the caucus system for the Georgia GOP. Um, and, you know, because we do have open primaries in Georgia. And mm -hmm. so not only do you have the issue of the government being involved, but you also have the issue of, you know, having open primaries and um, who ends up selecting your candidate and the money involved. I mean, you could save an inordinate amount of money mm -hmm. if you only had to convince somebody at a convention or a caucus uh, to vote for you. That's not unlike what they do in Virginia and in lots of other states. They, they have these, um, you know, convention type situations. Yeah, and I mean, I know on the local level, you just look at like a city council. Every time somebody leaves the office or there's any kind of reason that there's a vacancy in the office, I mean, just the expense that local councils have to go through to get 30 people to come out to vote. I mean, it's kind of a, a process that's just, you wonder if there's not a more effective way to do that. We're talking to Amanda Swafford. She's Swafford. She's a Flowery Branch resident. She is a former Flowery Branch City Council member. She's a Libertarian, and she is going to be on the ballot this November as the Libertarian candidate for United States Senate. We got a lot of hometown candidates on uh, the ballot this year. Hall County has really become sort of ground zero for Georgia power um, and Georgia political power, I should say. Uh, it may not be that way forever, but we've got a lieutenant governor that's from Hall County. Um, uh, governor is no longer living in Hall County. He's up in Habersham County, but he's from Hall County, lived here and worked most of his life. Uh, Craig Lutz is running for the Public Service Commission. Uh, and, you know, and I'm kind of glad, you know, I'm not taking sides in any of these races, but I love primaries. I think primary opposition is is really, really important. And, and I'm glad to see it, even though I think there's probably too much money in it. And I would support a caucus um, situation. I mean, I definitely would do that. But
But we're talking to Amanda Swafford today. She is the Libertarian candidate for United States Senate. She lives here in Flowery Branch. You're listening to North Georgia this week, and we love talking with you on Sunday mornings to find out what's happening. Now, if people want a couple of questions we're going to wrap up with. First of all, I want you to tell folks why um, uh, people should vote for you, but also um, how people can get in contact with you. So first of all, let's talk about why folks should vote for you. Well, you know, I think after being involved in politics for over 30 years, like I've been involved, and that sounds like a long time given, you know, my age, but really and truly, I've been following politics for that long and and across two different states in California and here and spending time in Washington, D.C. doing internships. You know, I just think that the time is right. The country is in such crazy shape financially. I mean, there's so many things that we're still to this day spending money on and people that are calling themselves fiscal hawks are voting for that it's just time. It's really just time that we get serious about electing a candidate that understands the power and responsibility of the individual instead of the power and responsibility of the federal government. And it just comes down to that. I mean, we have an individual obligation as a society to really understand that we need to look at our candidates and and look at them honestly and and really figure out who do we trust. You know, we keep saying we want more people like us in the Senate, but we never vote them. In there it's always it's not my congressman that's the problem but we really need to take an honest look on that so i encourage everyone to go to my website and check that out it's amandaswafford.net i've got a good welcome video on there that tells you a little bit more about my background and some of the things that form uh who i am and and how i was raised um and just get involved you know even if you don't support the libertarian party if you don't support me that's one of my biggest drivers and what i've always really been working very hard to do to do is to get people registered to vote to get people active to get them involved you know there's nothing worse than someone that just doesn't even understand for example that we have two senators in the state of georgia and that the senators are elected on a statewide basis i mean it's it's discouraging for six-year terms that's right exactly i mean it's, and they're not up every time i mean there's all kinds of little things like that again That's give right. that website again it is amanda swafford.net and again folks early voting started this past monday it will be going on until the friday before the primary which is uh the primary is on may the 20th and the early voting will go through may the 16th on may the 10th you'll be able to vote on saturdays uh, that's this coming saturday you'll be able to go to the polls there is no reason not to go out and vote. Now, with that said, if you don't have a inkling of who the candidates are, but I know the folks that are listening to this show do, do have an inkling, maybe you shouldn't vote, okay, if you don't have an inkling of who the candidates are. But think about all the candidates that are out there. There For the Senate race, there are seven Republicans, there are four Democrats, a lot of people, only people, person anybody's heard of is Michelle Nunn. But there are four Democrats that will be on that ballot if you pull that Democrat ballot. Uh, and when you get to the general election, you're going to have three candidates for a lot of these races, a Democrat, a Republican, and a Libertarian. So do your homework, and I hope that you'll do that. Again, for the news of the day, go to ClassicCityToday.com or ZPolitics.com, and you can get your news of the day there. You won't get better Georgia news than at ZPolitics.com. And if you have an idea for a program that you'd like me to talk about, email me at Martha at MarthaZoller.com. I check my own email. Staff doesn't do it. In fact, I am staff, so we check all the, all the emails. Hope you have a fantastic rest of the weekend and a great Sunday. It is North Georgia This Week, and I'm Martha Zoller.